Welcome to Prospect Street United Methodist Church. I'd like to welcome any first time visitors. Do we have any of those today? Okay, uh, we'll greet each other with Christian love. As you're heading back to your seats, please remember to, to sign in, uh, sign the registration pads. And let us prepare our hearts and minds for worshiping God as we silently listen to the prelude.
Please stand for the call to worship. <laughs> I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Let us say the opening prayer together. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for it.
how wonderful it is to see um, really how many children we have here and to be in that procession this morning. Just like it would have been on the first Palm Sunday, only all of you would have been following me too. But I thought that was a bit much to ask today, so we didn't do that. At this point in our service, it is, uh, we have an opportunity to give back to God just a small portion of what he has blessed us with each and every day. So as the ushers come, we will pause for a moment to ask a prayer over this offering. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for all you bless us with. And now we have the opportunity to give back to you just a portion of what you have blessed us with. Lord, bless all who give. Bless everyone who's here. That we may celebrate today your arrival as king in Jerusalem. In your name we pray. Amen. of the temple strew palms on the conqueror's way open your hearts O ye people that Jesus may enter today hark from the sick and the dying Forgetting their couches of pain. Voices, glad voices with rapture are swelling, are swelling, are swelling a glad. Glad voices with rapture are swelling, a glad, a glad refrain. Open the gates of the tent. One grand hallelujah be heard. Open your hearts to the Savior. Make room for the crucified Lord. Tears and the anguish of midnight are lost in the splendor of day. They who in sorrow and doubted are swelling, are swelling, are swelling a glad refrain. sorrow and stouted are swelling the glad, the glad refrain. I know, I know my redeemed 
canst thou, my heart, lift up thy voice, thy voice and sing, I know. You're fine. There we go. Have a seat right there. Oh, no, you're fine. You're on time, so you're good. Okay, so we came in this morning, and everybody waving palm branches. Do you know why we did that? Because today is Palm Sunday, Sunday, but why do we wave palms? Hi, buddy. Come sit down here. Why do we wave palms? Do you know? A day with palms, okay, yes. But, okay, what happened many, many years ago was... Donkey, donkey, correct, yes. Right, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey, and everybody was waving palms. They even took their coats off and laid them on the ground, and Jesus, the donkey, walked over them. Why did they do that? Because they were telling everyone, Jesus is king. They worshipped him. After all, he's God's son, right? So they were worshipping him. Some of those same people, by the end of the week, were in the crowd that yelled, crucify him. Isn't that bad? First, well, first they're saying, yes, Jesus is our king, and then they want to kill him. That's, I know, can you imagine that? That's not good at all. They were afraid. But you know, when we have Jesus in our heart and we make him king of our life, we don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be afraid for what somebody says because we know who is the truth and that's Jesus. Is that right? So say after me, Jesus is my king. Jesus is my king. Say it again. Jesus is my king. Very good. Always remember that. Okay? So let's put our hands together before you go learn more about this upstairs. Oh, Lord, we thank you for these wonderful kids. We thank you for the reminder that there were children there proclaiming Jesus as king, and it's so important that we pass that on to our children. Lord, be with them today and with their teachers and helpers as they learn more about what Palm Sunday is all about. In your name we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Amen.
As we come to prayer time, a couple of things to remind you about, and that is that we're coming up to a National Day of Prayer, and Cheryl already has the uh, posters out, you know, where you take off <clears throat> a time, so you can see her. She's at the back of the sanctuary. Also, um, please don't forget we have our Palm Sunday feast following this service, so just make your way after the service down into the fellowship hall. Um, also, uh, this week is Holy Week. We come here and celebrate Palm Sunday today. We come back next Sunday and celebrate Easter. But you miss the whole point if you don't do something in the in-between. We have a uh, Monday, Thursday Seder meal, and you can sign up on the sheets that are in the foyer. Make sure you sign up so we know how many will come. That's a very meaningful service and a time of fellowship. And please remember to bring a covered dish with food in it to share with everybody. Um, and also um, on Good Friday, there is a service at Epworth that we are taking part in. So please come and celebrate with us as we remember Good Friday and what happened. And that's at 7 o'clock. And all this information is actually in our bulletin. So if you take this with you, you'll have it with you for the rest of this week. In our prayers today, we want to remember Merwin and also Doris Mosier. Merwin is now back in the hospital and he is not doing well. So I will go over there after we've ha enjoyed our feast. So let us remember both of them. Let us remember David Miller. That's Joe and Joyce Miller's son. Um, he had a pain some time ago, and they thought it was nothing, but he now has to decide whether or not to choose surgery or radiation. He has a benign cyst on his, um, on his nerve, on his spine. So uh, we want to remember him. Barb Bishop asks prayers for her sister, Thelma Roten, who is in uh, California, in the hospital. She has severe amnesia. So, um, uh, no, anemic. She's not amnesia. Sorry, Hi, that was me. <laughs> she is severely amnemic, anemic. So let us remember her. Gosh. Bill Besks asks for a friend's daughter, um, Laura's daughter to be lifted up in prayer. She has meningitis. And Debbie and Fred ask prayers for their neighbor, Rudy Maynard, who is on hospice. Let us prepare our hearts as we go to worship at prayer this morning. Oh, Lord God, we come and bow down at the foot of your cross today. We know that many years ago, people entered Jerusalem following you, hailing as you a king. And by the end of the week, those same people are yelling, crucify him. If you were here today, we would be amongst that crowd. What would we choose to yell? Lord, we are swayed by many things, by many people, many, by many ideas. Help us this week to be focused on remembering the stories 
of what happened your final week on earth. You came here for a purpose. To teach, to die on the cross so that you could rise again on the third day so that our sins would be forgiven and that we could have the hope of eternal life. It's so simple to say, but the meaning is so deep. Lord, help us to experience Holy Week in a new way this week as we enter and die with you and rise with you. Lord, we remember all those that we have mentioned so far in our prayers. Comfort them, bring them peace, and bring them healing. We pray for those who have recently had surgery. Continue to touch them in their healing. For those facing surgery this coming week, Lord, we ask you to put your hands around them and guide the doctors and the nurses as they minister to their needs. Lord, we remember all those who this week will just see it as any other week, or maybe look forward to an Easter egg hunt or something that does not remind them of your sacrifice on the cross. Easter has become a celebration of secular things. But help us to remember the reason that we're here. And now together we lift up the prayer that you taught us as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the scripture from John 18, 28 through 37. <clears throat> then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the place of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid the ceremonial uncleanliness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done, Jesus said? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying, I am king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of God from long ago for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, open up our hearts and our minds today. 
let us listen to your word as we dig into the meaning behind your arrest, your trial, and your crucifixion, according to John. Let us understand the message that John is trying to give us. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I was on a roll. I'd got the kids off to school on time. I ran some errands I needed to do. I even managed to stop at the Y and swam my mile that was my tradition then. And I was on my way to Wittenberg University to finish doing research for my dissertation, which was coming up very shortly. I was interrupted by a phone call. Tim called and said, you need to stop at home. I began to argue, but I told you I'm going to be gone all day because I want to get this research done and, uh, and all this stuff. No, you need to stop at home. Well, as a dutiful wife, I put up an argument. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have to do that at all. And then he said, stop at home. So I hung up and turned down the road that took me home and was pretty upset by the time I got to the door. <clears throat> I walked in, and he said, your brother called. You need to call him back. And Andrew said, dad was found dead this morning in his bed. I had been so pumped up that, this morning, that morning. I was excited about getting on with my day and getting done the things that I wanted to so I could enjoy the weekend. But suddenly, my world was turned upside down. Have you ever been there? Maybe some of you are there right now. Maybe some of you are at the time of Palm Sunday when it's all roses and you're celebrating. Well, hold on, because Good Friday is just around the corner. That's what happened to all the followers of Jesus on this Palm Sunday. Started with a bang. Finally, the person they had followed all this time was going to come into his own as a leader in Jerusalem. He rode in on this donkey, a sign of peace, not a sign of war. And suddenly, people were there waving palm branches and putting their clothes, coats on the ground. Everyone yelling, Hosanna, King of the Jews. And by the end of that week, those same people in the crowd, yelling that this hero, their king, should be crucified. The disciples' world had been turned upside down in just a few days. And as we read John's Gospel, chapters uh, 18 and 19, and of course I'm assuming you all read it, so you're with me, if you didn't, you need to read that this week. Because John paints a very, very different picture than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Because he has a different message for us to grasp. So what is that different message? Well, first of all, we have to know what Matthew, Mark, and Luke said, right? Basically, during Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion, they are focusing on the fact that Jesus talks about his coming kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a pearl. It's like a number of things in all three Gospels that um, is described. And the second thing the Synoptic Gospels do is to tell us how human Jesus was. For example, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. He asks his disciples to pray, and then he goes a little portion away, and he kneels down, and he is praying so hard that he even sweats drops of blood. And he prays to his father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, yours be done. Is that not just a human thing we do. Cut, take away this pain. Don't let me face this, whatever it is I'm facing. 
but I surrender to your will. He was arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and all night long they judged him and asked him questions and debated among themselves. And eventually they found him guilty and they took him to Pilate for sentencing because they wanted him dead and they couldn't do it. Their charge was blasphemy because Jesus claimed to be the son of God, even God himself. He was beaten, spat upon, flogged, mocked. They put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns on his head. And Pilate sentenced him to death by crucifixion. It appears here that the Romans are the ones who actually were responsible for killing Jesus. Jesus was weak. He couldn't even carry his cross all the way to the place where they were going to crucify him. So a man, Simon of Cyrene, was pulled in to help carry that cross, to help carry the burden that Jesus had. And Jesus was crucified at noon on Passover day. I haven't told you anything you haven't already heard. You know these stories. But that's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke say. Not very often do we focus on what John says during this time, but it's very different. So here's what John says. He focuses on the fact that Jesus is the king. We hear Hosanna, you know, to the king of David in the other uh, gospels, but John focuses on it all the way through, especially during the trial and the arrest. And he also focuses on, because he already knows what Matthew, Mark, and Luke have done, focused on the human side of Jesus, the pain and the suffering. He tells us about Jesus' divine side. You see, up until now, or at this time, people thought that maybe Jesus was half human, half God. Kind of like the gods that the Romans and the Greeks worshipped. You remember those stories, right? But Jesus was fully human and fully divine. So John is going to focus on that so that we will know. For example, in the garden, when he is arrested, Jesus says, or it says that Jesus knew everything that was about to happen. That's not human, is it? I can take a good guess at what's going to happen, but I don't really know. Jesus did. He was in control of everything that happened. He had the strength to achieve the goal given to him by his Father above. The story of the arrest in the garden is very different. John says that a cohort of soldiers, that's 600, came to arrest one man. We may think that's a little extreme, but John was trying to point to the fact how dangerous Jesus had become to the Jews and to the Romans. They were afraid that he really was the Son of God. They were afraid as an imposter that he had too many followers that were taking um, them away from their beliefs. As these soldiers approach them, he is asked, Are you Jesus the Nazarene? And he replies, I am. He said, Yahweh. He spoke that name that is above all names. And suddenly, all the soldiers and the people there fell down at that name he proclaimed. It's almost as if they were forced to bow down to Jesus before he was going to do the most spectacular thing that anybody has ever done for the human race. He was asked again, 
are you Jesus the Nazarene? And he said, I am. Instead of pleading for his father to take away the cup that he was facing, he announced, am I not to drink the cup the father has given me? Jesus really is the son of God, a divine being. He's arrested. He spends just a few moments with Annas, who was the previous high priest, and then with Caiaphas, not very long at all. We don't even hear that he goes before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. But he is immediately taken to Pilate. Here's where things get interesting. Because they go to the palace and Pilate wants them to come in. And they say, oh no, we can't. Because we're coming up to a very holy feast, Passover. And if they entered a Gentile place, they would become unclean and would miss the, the feast, the supper. So Pilate comes out to them and they start having this discussion. What crime has he committed? You know, has he even committed a crime? They're almost mocking Pilate. Well, we wouldn't have brought him here if he hadn't. It's a different crime. It's a different charge that the Jews bring. This time, they say, he has committed insurrection. That is claiming to be king of the Jews. And that crime is punishable by death. Pilate, during his conversation with Jesus, they have a lengthy conversation, and he determines to be able to set Jesus free because he finds no wrong with him. But the Jews keep insisting, and Pilate gets scared. Finally, Pilate gives in and hands him over to them. He carries the cross by himself, no help from anyone. And in John's gospel, Jesus is crucified on the day of preparation, which is the day before Passover. Why these differences? I'm coming to that. But first of all, I want to pause and ask, who was really on trial according to John's gospel? The Jews are on trial. They appear on the outside to be religious and holy and carrying out their law. They stand on Pilate's porch and they say that they are so religious they cannot step in because they can't get unclean. And they actually say to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. Suddenly they are moral, religious citizens, uh, Roman citizens, sorry. They say they don't have the right to kill anyone. Have you read the Old Testament? How many killings? Remember when we were studying the Old Testament? So many people said to me, when is this killing going to end? Well, it doesn't end. They have not given Jesus a fair trial. In John's gospel, John puts the Jews on trial. Pilate is on trial. He has this long conversation, this interaction with Jesus, not with the Jews, but with Jesus himself. And he sees no wrong in the man. And yet, he fears Rome he fears the Jewish leaders and he fears this crowd that is building outside his palace. And in the end, what Pilate does is to choose the king of the land, Caesar, over the king of the universe, Jesus. The crowd is on trial. They are being swayed by the leaders, caught up in the tension that's rising saying things that later 
they wonder why they ever said. And Jesus is on trial. He is the only one who is calm and confident, not swayed by what others say or think. Jesus only speaks the truth. He will fulfill his destiny to the end, and his destiny, destiny is to uh, testify to the truth, to do the Father's will, to show God's unconditional love for all humankind. And you know what? Today, we are on trial. Jesus asks us, who is your king? Is Jesus really the king of your life? Or is it your country, your family, your friends, your work, your house, your money, your church, your activities? The list goes on and on. Who is your king? Now, John points to the fact that Jesus is, Jesus is crucified on the day of preparation, the day before Passover. And the other three gospel writers say it's Passover day. Who's right? Who do we believe? Answer, both of them. Because they're telling us something different about Jesus. When Jesus dies, according to the synoptic gospels, on Passover day, they are reminding us that on the original Passover... A lamb was slaughtered, and from that lamb they took blood and put it on the lintel and the doorposts of their house. Why? So that the angel of death would pass over and their children would not die. They're saying Jesus died to protect us from death, permanent. So what is John saying by saying that he died on the day of preparation? Jesus was put on the cross at noon. And he says that died at three o'clock in the afternoon. On the day of preparation, Jews would have selected their lamb and taken it to the temple. And right at three o'clock in the afternoon is when all the lambs were slaughtered. John is saying, Jesus is the Lamb of God, the one who died once and for all so that no one else may ever die without having eternal life. John tells us that Jesus drank sour wine from a hyssop branch. The other Gospels mostly don't say that he drank anything but John wants us to notice this hyssop branch. It was hyssop that they used to put the blood on the doorposts to ensure their children would not die. Jesus is the one who liberates us and ensures that we too will not have to die. And a hyssop branch is used in Jewish rites of purification. In Psalm 51, 7, David says, Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Pilate, according to John, proclaims Jesus to be king to the whole world. You know that sign that's put above his cross that says, Jesus, King of the Jews? Every single person who was crucified would have a sign put above that cross to tell people what their charge was, what their crime was, who they were. The Jews wanted it changed to, this man said he was King of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. But here's the important part. He put it in three languages. They weren't all in three languages. Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. 
the three languages of the known world at that time, which was that Middle Eastern area. He wanted to make sure everybody who was there would know who this was. He proclaimed that Jesus was king to the whole world when really he didn't mean to. Who is on trial here? Who killed Jesus? We all did. Every single one of us. Every time we have denied him. Every time we've felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit and not followed through with it. Every time we've chosen to do something of our own instead of what God wants. Even to the point of, I'll do my devotions later because I'll have more time then and that time never comes. In John's Gospel, Unlike the other Gospels, his final words on the cross are, it is finished. It is complete. The victory has been won. The mission has been accomplished. God's masterpiece has been rendered. The broken relationship that started between God and humans in the Garden of Eden, has now been restored forevermore. All the hurt, the hate, the sin of the world has been overcome by the death of our King. But before we get too excited thinking about the resurrection, we must focus on what happened this week. If you can, attend at least one of the services. But I'm gonna, we're going to end this service a little differently. So you can think about this. I have a couple more words to say. And then we are going to sing our final song. And you're going to remain seated while we do that. I want you to think about the words that you sing. The altar, the lectern will be stripped. And once that is done, we will remain seated for the postlude. And then I'm going to ask you to exit in silence, in respect of what Jesus did for us those years ago. And then you can go downstairs and make all the noise you want as we celebrate our Palm Sunday feast. So I leave you with a question today. Who is your king? Who do you live for day in, day out? How many people would lay down their lives for you? Let's sing our final.